Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Jenny Dodson, and I'm the Executive Director for the Healthcare Reform Center and Policy Institute. And we have the pleasure today of being joined by one of our faculty who is, we like to call, the founding father of a lot of this material. So we're excited to have him, and I'll go into that in a few minutes. Um, for those of you that are certified healthcare reform specialists, I'd like you to bear with me. I do have a few quick announcements I'd like to talk about regarding our programs and services. Um, then I will move right into the presentation. So without further ado, I'll get started. Today we're going to do the impact of 2016 elections on the ACA. While we don't have a crystal ball, we do have a lot of experts that have good insight into what we think might happen as we move into the 2017 year with regard to the elections. Before we do that, though, I wanted to be able to go into our presentation and talk to you about some of the challenges that healthcare reform creates for our participants. A lot of participants are facing challenges with legalities and understanding the compliance. Um, IRS fines, they're inevitable and inevitable and um, you know frequent. The law has thousands and thousands of pages, so understanding that is difficult at you know best. Um, employee hour tracking is also an issue. Um, without a solution, that can be a huge problem. Communications on ACA to employees is an issue. So we decide the Gonda program that actually addresses a lot of these issues. For those of you that have taken the program, you know that it kind of covers each one of those topics that I mentioned. Additionally, we have um, basically built a bridge to overcoming these challenges for participants that take our course. The participants that take our course are HR professionals and brokers, TPAs, consultants that are looking to be able to answer the important questions either to their C-suite or to their um, clients, their employer clients. We announce you to the world once you pass this test, so it's pretty exciting. Once you've taken the course, and there's a couple of ways to do it, we're able to kind of tell all of our participants in our, our database that you've done your due diligence in getting the training. Our distribution channels look like this. Basically on LinkedIn, I think we're up to a million followers now on our LinkedIn channel. We have about 45,000 Facebook followers, 10,000 tw Twitter, 11,000 Twitter followers, 3,000 attendees at our annual event, thousands of participants that have already taken the course, and our magazine reaches about 300,000. So when I say we announce you to the world, we literally do talk to the world. Um, across our databases, we have about 2.1 million people that are able to see that you've passed the course. Why take the certification? I mean, it's kind of simple. You get to learn all you need to know about what's happening with the ACA. You get to get these vital changes that are occurring within the law, and we anticipate there will be some. Uh, and then you also get access to our experts, and so if you have a conundrum with a client or your C-suite has a, a challenge with what you're doing regarding compliance, you can email me, and I'll be delighted to send that question off to our faculty. The faculty tends to answer the question usually within one to two business hours. Um, sometimes it can take up to 72 business hours, but they do answer your question. And they're also very frank. If it's an issue or a conundrum that you're having that is an actual legal issue, they'll let you know that as well. They'll tell you that you, know, you actually have a problem that needs legal counsel, either seeking that through your own uh, legal counsel or um, alternatively hiring a legal counsel to get through the uh, conundrum or problem that you're facing. So it's probably one of the best uh, benefits of becoming a specialist um, that you get these billable, these expert attorneys that you know have five hundred to a thousand dollars in billable hours that are able to give you a quick answer and um, advice on what to do next. So it's a really great benefit. Um, you know, we also provide immediate updates, uh, just like the one we're about to provide you today. We provide um, resources through our resource center, and um, we give you, you know, sort of first attention. Um, the other reason is, of course, employers respect it, um, and it's actually a prerequisite in a lot of cases to even get in a job in today's market. So it's a great tool. Some of our clientele you'll be able to see that have taken the course: uh, ADP, Aon, Humana, Mercer, Halocity. Those are just a few. We also have employers that have taken it. I would say don't take our word for it. These are a few people that have actually, you know, been able to, to give us a testimony as to why it was such a great class for them. 
um, Maria Beatty said, you know, that the certification provided her the coursework to enhance her understanding of ACA and to understand the government, what the government expects um, and how to understand the mandate and how it's going to be administered. And she's with ADP. Um, we also had Karen Gathercole. Recently, she gave a, a presentation for us on a day in the life of HR as it relates to the mandate, which was really great. And she was able to share with us how she developed um, through her skills uh, the ability to keep track of her billable hour or her employees um, um, in her FTE's hours and um, ensure that they weren't sent into a fine situation. And they use a um, excellent tool as well as software. Um, she shared about that as well. And she wouldn't have known kind of even which direction to go without taking this course. And now she's one of our cheerleaders. And more importantly, she's done a great job with her own um, career and, and saved her company, you know, thousands to be able to um, ensure that we don't have, that they don't run into fines. So um, you can brand yourself with this certification. Of course, you can, once you pass the exam, we send you all of the appropriate branding um, for the course. We send you the seal that you can use. We send you the backdrop for your LinkedIn account. Um, we send you proper branding for your website or business cards. So you can actually brand yourself as an expert and use that for your C-suite, you know, when you're getting in the door talking to them about this, it's kind of backing you up that you actually understand what you're talking about. And as a broker or a consultant, when you go into the room and you have this um, designation, it helps you as well to be able to walk into that room with confidence that you really do know what you're talking about. There's a couple ways to take the course. You can do it online at your leisure or we'll come to your office and train, you know, a bunch of you in one place in one day. We can do that via webcast live and uh, kind of shoot out to your office and you can have live interactive discussions with the faculty and or you can just do it online at your leisure or we'll fly out and do it for you. If you have a large enough group, we'll fly out and do it for you, um, you know, based on the trainer schedule and your schedule. So uh, finally, how do you get it? You know, you take it live or online. You know, you pass the exam, and then you gain access to all of these valuable resources that I've been talking about. Some of our presenters, we have Jim Napoli with Cy Shaw, Alan Bianchi from Men's Levin, um, Sybil from Hub. These are all expert benefit attorneys that work for a variety of different um, fields in both uh, employee benefits um, and, and specializing in that law, as well as we're basically the top um, employee benefit firms in the country. Um, we also have Phyllis Borzai, Alan Tashevsky, who's former deputy AG from the IRS. We also have Christine Link Young, who's actually now back with the um, HHS. So we have a lot of um, great input. And of course, today um, we have Ben Connolly, as I mentioned before. He's one of the founding uh, members of our faculty, he helped us develop and hone the material in, and working with the other faculty. And um, so we have the pleasure of hearing from him today. So I apologize if I took too much time, but I did want to have the opportunity to share what we do with you. And without further ado, I'm going to pass the ball over to Ben so he can do what you came to do here, which is our presentation. So go ahead, Ben. Thank you very much, Jenny. I, I appreciate it. Uh, so obviously, um, there have been a number of developments in the last uh, six months or so. Uh, and some very notable developments in the last month uh, in that a number of employers have started receiving notices from the marketplace indicating that their employees have received some sort of tra tax credit and providing employers the opportunity to contest eligibility for that tax credit. Uh, so we thought it might make sense uh, with that in the backdrop and then with the pending election to talk about some of the uh, developments and sort of a, a glance into the future and talk about what the election might mean for purposes of the ACA. So um, first thing I want to do is give a really high level, very brief background on where things stand, because I know we have a wide array of subject, subject matter expertise on the phone, uh, starting with the employer mandate, which is, I think, the thing that keeps many of us up at night. Uh, so again, the employer mandate mandates that uh, applicable large employers, which now means 50 or more full-time equivalent employees, offer health insurance coverage to uh, every full-time employee, otherwise they could be liable for a, uh, a fine. Uh, this year, again, uh, we used to have a, here's what the rule is for 2015, now it's what it is for 2016. We are clearly in 2016 where the, the penalties have gotten harsher 
and the margin for error has gotten slimmer. Uh, so this penalty, the, the catastrophic penalty that you truly want to avoid could apply if you fail to offer coverage to at least 95% of your full-time employees. If you do so, your organization could be responsible for a penalty of 2160 multiplied by all full-time employees. Now, just to be clear on that, you have a 5% margin of error here. Let's say you're an organization with uh, 101 full-time employees, uh, or 100, that's a little easier for math purposes, uh, and you've offered coverage to 94 of them, uh, but you failed to offer coverage to six of them. If even one of those six people goes to the exchanges and receives a tax credit, you are now paying the penalty on all 100 people not just on those five that you did not offer coverage to or those four that you did not offer coverage to, and that's a penalty of 2160 multiplied by all those people. That's a, a horrendous result and certainly a circumstance you want to avoid if at all possible. <clears throat> and I think that a lot of people have kind of been lulled into complacency for a couple of reasons. Number one, uh, we haven't until this month received any indication that we've done anything wrong. Uh, you know, we identify people we think are full-timers, we've offered them all coverage, but within the last month we're now starting to receive notice that individuals who we thought were not full-time employees or for that matter individuals who we thought were not our employees at all have gone to the exchange, represented that they're our employee and received a tax credit. That's problematic for a number of reasons, but certainly if the number of those impacted people exceeds 5% of your full-time workforce, you've got a significant problem. Even if it doesn't exceed 5% of your workforce, if you received even one notice and you don't feel completely confident that you've hit 95% of your workforce, again, you've got a big problem there. Um, now, even if you have offered the coverage to that 95% of your full-time employees, you can still face liability on an individual by individual basis, but that's more of a tolerable result, again, assuming you've uh, met that 95% threshold. Um, but again, even if you miss a single full-time employee, you could face a penalty of up to 3240 um, for that individual multiplied by the number of individuals that you missed or for whom coverage was unaffordable or not minimum value who received a tax credit. Um, so that's the background. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about ACA reporting obligations, but before I do, I want to delve a little bit into uh, the election and the potential impact that might have on both the employer mandate penalties, which we just discussed, but also looking forward to what we're about to discuss, the ACA reporting obligations. There is a, uh, you know, lingering, albeit common misperception that we should just wait and see what happens with this election and the IRS isn't really going to be assessing penalties in after, until after the outcome of the election and as a result we don't really have to do anything. Uh, I want to dispel you of that misperception at this point because regardless of the outcome of the election, uh, you know, we've been through one year of applicability and there are procedural hurdles in place that even if you get Republican presidency, Republican Congress, it's going to take a bit of, bit of time to unwind this law. And even if the law is unwound, um, I don't think you're going to see as whole wholesale of a uh, unwinding as many have suspected. And what I mean by that is, uh, uh, generally speaking, if rules are in effect and finalized, which everything we're talking about here in the context of empl the employer mandate, that is the case, uh, number one, the president cannot, through regulatory action, simply change the rules. They have to go through the regulatory agency for that process. It's much more difficult to do to the extent that rules have been finalized, which, again, all of these rules have been finalized. Even if they do go through that process, there are, uh, associated with, you know, any rulemaking, a mandatory notice of comment period, notice and comment period that can easily extend to, you know, uh, uh, regulations issued, which, by the way, takes a while. They got to write the rules, which government agencies don't just, you know, sit down in a room and bang these out in an afternoon. That can take months of stakeholder input. They have to send them to the OMB for budgetary approval, and they issue proposed rules. Following issuance of those proposed rules, there's usually a 60-day notice and comment period. After they receive those comments, they go back and rewrite the rules uh, as as need be. Uh, followed by, you know, and the whole process starts again, such that the final rules wouldn't even be effective until likely uh, 2018 at the earliest, at the absolute earliest. The likelihood is that it would potentially significant, uh, be significantly later than that, uh, probably 2019 at the earliest. Congressional action is always an option as well, um, but that presumes a lot. Uh, I think to a certain extent you need to presume that there's, again, 
uh, a single party in power throughout Congress and the White House. Even if there is only a, you know, a Republican-dominated Congress and the White House, the likelihood is that it's not going to be a veto-proof, or I'm sorry, a, 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 a filibuster-proof majority, <clears throat> meaning that with, unless the Republicans are able to use um, special maneuvering, which isn't outside of the realm of possibility because that's how this law got pa passed in the first place, it's going to be very, very difficult to uh, unwind and overturn this law. So, uh, and then, by the way, anything else, any other result, if you've got uh, a mixed Congress where you've got Democrats and Republicans, or if you have a, a Democrat in the White House, uh, I think you're not going to see anything happen or, or, you know, any significant changes to the law. So even if um, the extreme event happens, which is, it is that it is a Republican-dominated House of Congress and presidency, it's still going to take time. Now, I don't want to downplay this, the possibility of that happening because clearly in 2008 we did have a sole party in Congress and in the White House. Um, but, you know, again, if you're looking at current polling, the suggestion is that certainly uh, everything could go any, any particular way, but there doesn't seem to be a trend towards a single party dominating all branches of Congress and the White House. Um, next year. So I guess the takeaway is, you know, we've been saying this for a couple years uh, now, but uh, proceed according to plan, proceed assuming that this law will remain in effect. The IRS is clearly doing so, um, and the IRS seems to have no intent to tap the brakes in this regard because, um, you know, they're, they're moving forward with uh, collection of all the forms that were submitted at the end of June processing those forms, and I think what you're going to start to see is penalty notices in the, in the relatively near future, likely in the fall of this year. Um, so stay tuned, but I think the key is, again, uh, regardless of uh, the outcome of the election, uh, you're going to see uh, you're going to see a potential risk here. Um, one of the, uh, Jenny, I don't know if you want me to take questions as, as they come in or if you prefer that we wait and do all those at the end. Uh, no, I mean, you can take them throughout, and we can do some at the end. Um, okay. So especially if they are real, relative to what you're talking about, it's fine. Sure. All right, so the question is, is is it 95% of el the 95% threshold, is it eligible employees, um, uh, for example, those who have met the 1560 hours requirement and injured the administrative period? Uh, the standard is full-time employees, uh, the standard that you have to meet. now. Full-time can mean a number of different things, but we're talking about full-time here in the context of the ACA. So generally speaking, 130 hours a month, that can be measured either on a monthly basis or on a look-back stability period basis. If you are looking at the look-back stability period basis, that would only include those employees who are in the stability period or, for instance, full-timers who are hired into a full-time role that have, you know, gone outside of their initial limited non-assessment period. So again, full-time employees, 95% of full-time employees, um, regardless of your plan's eligibility standards, full-time is determined based on ACA thresholds. So again, that's a little bit of the background of the penalty itself, uh, a little bit of uh, oversight of the election. I mean, you know, I can sit up here and say, here's who's going to win the presidency, um, but uh, that's meaningless uh, to, to the folks uh, uh, on the call. You, you guys know from having been through several election cycles, it's far too early at this point to make any predictions, um, but I think the likelihood is <clears throat> if I had to make a prediction, regardless of what happens, I don't believe there will be a single-party filibuster-proof majority in Congress and uh, same party in the presidency. So uh, at the end of the day, I don't believe you're going to see um, uh, these standards apply across the board. Uh, another question here that came through, do the same requirements apply to paid interns? Uh, interns uh, usually are full-time employees. Or I'm sorry, not full-time employees. Interns usually are employees. In other words, um, uh, you know, unless you can argue the intern works for another organization or is not your employee, which is a hard argument to make, they're usually your employee. So the only question that remains is, is this intern a full-time employee? Uh, Full-time status is determined based on hours of service, um, which includes paid hours. Uh, if it's an unpaid intern, typically they're not accruing any paid hours of service, so they're not going to be a full-time employee. If they are a paid intern, they are measured just like any other individual, unless you can call them a seasonal employee. Um, I don't want to go down that rabbit hole too deeply because we do have a lot of other items we want to cover here, but um, I think the key there is that there's no special carve-out for, for interns. Uh, you have to analyze them uh, for the most part just like any other employee. So we now have been through the reporting cycle one time. 
The good news is we all made it through and we're all alive. Um, although, from what I understand, due to system errors on the IRS side, uh, there are, have been some issues that have extended potentially the deadline for certain uh, employers attempting to submit their their returns, uh, but regardless of that, um, uh, you know we now have a much better sense for what that whole process looks like, having been through it one time uh, than we did last year. Um, again, providing a little bit of background here on the nature of the reporting standards, the reporting obligation applies to any organization that provides minimum essential coverage and then any applicable large employer, which again is 50 or more full-time equivalent employees, looking back to the prior year. First year we had 100 or more as our standard uh, uh, for penalty purposes, but the 50 or more always applied for reporting purposes. That has not changed, so uh, theoretically 50 or more uh, you should have reported last year, um, but you know, uh, clearly it's more significant this year because there can be more significant penalties that attach for failure to report. Um, for our purposes today, we are going to focus on the, um, the C-series forms, which are those that primarily apply to the applicable large employer group. Now, clearly, if you have a self-funded plan, uh, regardless of size, you have a reporting obligation. Usually, you don't see employers with under 50 employees who also have a self-funded plan, but it's not outside of the realm of possibility. So you just want to keep an eye on that. Uh, but what we're going to talk about a little bit here today is the C-Series forms, because that is the one that has been the most, uh, 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 the most significant. Um, I, I'm seeing a few other questions come in that are, are a bit um, uh, circumstance specific. Uh, so I'm going to hold those at the end and certainly we'll try to uh, address those if we have time and no other questions. Um, but, uh, you know, if, if we have general questions of general applicability that come in, uh, I'm certainly going to try and take those as well. Um, including, uh, was our recent appeals court ruling that struck down the MEC requirement? The answer is no. There was an appeals court ruling that struck down um, the cost-sharing subsidies available in the health insurance marketplace, uh, for all intents and purposes, for our call, that's uh, first it's on hold uh, pending uh, higher court review, but second, that's not going to impact the employer mandate um, at its core, uh, so you don't need to necessarily change your perspective based on that ruling. <clears throat> the other thing is, can we talk about TIN validation errors? Uh, yes, we will cover that in just a, just a moment here. All right. so. Uh, you're now familiar with the forms, um, and I'm not going to go through the nuanced detail of the forms because hopefully uh, the folks on the phone have already turned those in for that this year. Um, for next year, clearly there's going to be some changes. The first and most notable change, by the way, uh, the IRS has released draft 2016 forms. We haven't seen the instructions yet, but we do have seen the draft forms, so we kind of know what we're going to uh, what we're going to be looking for. First, uh, on the 1094C, there were a series of transition relief available. Um, one of those forms of transition relief was the qualifying offer method transition relief. What that said essentially was that if you made a qualifying offer to at least 95% of your full-time employees, you had somewhat simplified reporting. You could use codes 1A and 1L when indicating whether there was an offer or no offer of coverage uh, during the course of the year. That was always, a, always going to be a one-time thing. That form of transition relief has been converted to uh, reserved, which I think means we're holding that space so you don't mess up the forms too much, but that's probably going to go away based on what we're seeing now. Uh, that's pretty insignificant in the grand scheme of things. In fact, um, even though many organizations I work with qualified for that transition relief, most did not use it because it was really one that didn't excite us that much, didn't really make things any simpler. Um, so, you know, for what it's worth, it looks like that's going away. Everything on page two remained the same, um, but the big significant change here is that when you look at this column A, which is did you offer minimum essential coverage to uh, the qualifying threshold of full-time employees, in 2015 you were allowed to check this box if you hit the 70% threshold. Uh, now that we are in 2016, when you're completing these forms in early 2017, you will only be permitted to check this box if you offered coverage to 95% of your full-time employees. So just keep an eye on that. Again, the margin for error has gotten much lesser. Uh, control group still needs to be reported on the final page of this form. Uh, nothing has changed there. I think the thing that might uh, be of note here is that in 2015, there was a good faith reporting standard, which made 
people a little more comfortable, uh, you know, getting to a relatively high level of certainty without reaching absolute certainty. Uh, because again, if you think you're right but you don't know for certain, at least you made a good faith effort. Uh, you know, it's, it remains unclear, but there's no indication that the IRS is going to roll over that good faith reporting standard into 2016. So what that means is that you need to figure it out uh, to the best degree of certainty you can who is in your control group because this list needs to be accurate. Uh, and there can be penalties that attach for failure to have an accurate list of uh, related employers. Uh, the next one we're going to talk about is the 1095C. This is the employee-specific form that talked about uh, who had coverage and during what months. Uh, it also talked about the cost of that coverage, and then finally it listed safe harbor codes. So, uh, by the way, that's line 14, 15, and 16. Safe harbor code being the big key there because if you had a safe harbor code on that line and if it was accurate, that means your organization would not be penalized for that month for that individual, again, assuming it's accurate. Um, so, uh, and, then, and then finally, if for self-funded employers, you were required to list the uh, dependents, or the employee and the dependents, the Social Security numbers in the months in which they had coverage. Uh, important point here, and this is the TIN validation error. Uh, we started hearing early on in the process um, and continued hearing repeatedly from pretty much every employer organization we work with that when they submitted these forms to the IRS, they were receiving an error message, TIN validation error, or uh, accepted with errors, and the error being that there was a TIN validation. What that means is we got your return, everything looks okay, but it looks like there are some incorrect Social Security numbers in this included in this report. or. Um, social security numbers that don't align with um, our IRS standards. Now, there are two levels of um, uh, uh, concern here. One is with uh, the Part 3 reporting where you're listing the employee and the dependents and the social security numbers. That is, uh, uh, there is a set process that the IRS has established for soliciting social security numbers, and that is if you make three solicitations, one at higher date, one at the first enrollment and one at the second enrollment, then you've done your due diligence uh, in collecting Social Security numbers and you can instead use date of birth. Now, the issue that arises is, number one, what if you solicited those numbers and the one you got is wrong and you're getting rejected on that uh, front? Number two is, what about the employee level? When you're listing uh, up in part one, the employee Social Security number, um, and you're getting rejection there, theoretically you should know your own employee's Social Security number. Uh, Couple thoughts on this. First, uh, the IRS released some guidance on Friday that clarified or reiterated what we already know, which is that um, you know if you've done your due diligence and made reasonable efforts in this regard, there should not be a penalty. And in, as long as you've done your due diligence and you are still receiving an accepted with errors response from the IRS, you don't have to keep going until you get accepted with no errors. You can keep the evidence that you've done that uh, due diligence. Um, and you shouldn't have a problem. Uh, now, I think an important note there is that think, take a step back and think about the reason why the IRS needs the Social Security numbers. The IRS wants Social Security numbers not for the employer mandate purpose. You know, if you offer coverage to that individual under the employer mandate, you're good and you're set and you're good to go. They want it for the individual mandate because under the individual mandate, and particularly Part 3, which is exclusively for purposes of the individual mandate, uh, individuals need to demonstrate that they have obtained health insurance coverage for themselves and for their tax qualifying dependents. And you're just the, you know, the, the flow through reporting mechanism for facilitating that process and that you're sponsoring the coverage and saying, you know, what the social security number is. But if they're providing you with incorrect information, then it's really not your problem at the end of the day if you've done your due diligence. It becomes that employee's problem because they're the ones who need that report saying here's what, you know, who had, uh, coverage, and if they have not, uh, you know, if they have not done that, then they're they're going to be out of luck on the tail end. So there is an incentive to employees to provide you with that correct information. Now, realistically, what we find is happening is that there is some disconnect between the IRS systems, uh, and they're very finicky, such that. You know, uh, if you have a Social Security number associated with a name and the name is a married na a maiden name or uh, apostrophe in the wrong place or slight misspelling or typo in the name, that can cause a rejection with errors. Um, 
you know, certainly, again, I want to reiterate that you do want to do the due, due diligence on your part to determine whether uh, uh, whether there is, you know, anything that you've done from a, you know, transposition error uh, where you got the correct number uh, and typed it in wrong. But if you got the number, you entered the information correctly and it's still wrong, generally that's going to satisfy your obligation at least for this year. One of the questions that came through is, is there an explanation for why we're getting these rejections for the 1095C but not for the W-2? Uh, there isn't. Um, I've asked that question myself many, many times. Um, and at the end of the day, uh, I think it's just different systems. Um, so, you know, I think they'll fix it going into next year. I mean, this year is all sort of self-reported to a certain extent anyway. Um, it is and it isn't. But, uh, you know, right now that this is a new report and the IRS doesn't have the systems in place like they do on the W-2 side to validate that information, cross-reference, cross-check, and all those types of things. Um, what else do I want to say about this? Uh, there are some changes to this form. Uh, notably, um, Code 1A will remain, but again, qualifying offer, uh, because the qualifying offer uh, remains on the transition relief. But Code 1L is going away because co Code 1L, again, corresponded to that qualifying offer method transition relief, which, as noted earlier, is no longer available uh, going into the 2016 reporting cycle. Um, two other new codes relate to conditional offers of coverage to a spouse. Uh, so the IRS now wants to know if, for instance, you've offered spouses coverage, but only if they don't have coverage through their employer. Or potentially, we haven't seen the instructions yet, but potentially if you have some, something of a spousal surcharge that applies, uh, the IRS wants to know that information. And again, we haven't seen the instructions, but presumably when we do, uh, codes 1J and 1K may be applicable in that setting. Another question that came through, if I find an error on the 1095C, do I need to reissue that to the employee? Technical answer is yes. Uh, the IRS instructions are clear on this point. If you've issued a 1095C that has uh, incorrect information, you do need to reissue that. Um, you know, I know of a lot of people that aren't doing it on the basis that, well, I got the right information to the IRS. That's all that should matter. Um, I get that. Uh, certainly, uh, your exposure there is somewhat less, but, you know, the IRS instruction on these points are clear, so that becomes a judgment risk call on the employee, on the employer standpoint, whether they want to reissue that, uh, that information. Question here is, what will be the difference between 1A and 1K? Uh, well, they're totally different things. Uh, 1A is qualifying offer to the employee, the spouse, and the dependents. Qualifying offer means it's affordable. Um, based on the, uh, I think that one is the federal poverty line safe harbor, uh, meaning less than roughly $92 a month. 1K is that you had a conditional offer to the spouse, meaning the spouse's coverage was, for instance, conditioned on, uh, on the not having coverage from their employer or whatever the case might be. Again, we haven't seen the instructions. We know that 1K is going to be a conditional offer to a spouse. Uh, but the IRS has not indicated yet, has not released the instructions that would indicate uh, the various circumstances in which you might use that. The two series codes, the safe harbor codes, appear to remain the same, so uh, uh, full steam ahead on those, uh, and we have not seen anything indicating that those are going to be any different um, uh, going forward. Question came in, came through is will we have to provide validation that we as an employer made qualifying offer? I mean, I guess what I would say is that nothing has changed in that regard. Uh, you are submitting a form to the IRS under penalty of perjury saying that you made a qualifying offer. The IRS could check that um, in two circumstances: number one, on audit, or number two, if the employee receives a tax credit and contests that uh, qualifying offer. Um, so. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, uh, I don't. You don't have to submit proof with your filing that says you that shows that you made that offer, but you don't want to. You certainly don't want to be wrong on that uh, when you're submitting a tax form. Uh, all right, I think we already talked about part three, so I'm going to keep keep plowing ahead here. In terms of compliance penalties, uh, the IRS thought that people were apparently not 
um, taking this seriously enough, so they've ratcheted up the penalties significantly. This was this happened last year, by the way. This isn't new. The key distinction between last year and this year, though, is that there is a, uh, a waiver of penalties for good faith efforts. Uh, that you know, unless the IRS takes action to extend that another year, that will not be around next year. Another question that came through: Will be there any? Will there be any changing uh, in the coding for union employees? <clears throat> At present, it doesn't look like it. Uh, code 2E, which is the Multi-Employer Transition Relief Code, uh, is still there um, from what we can tell. Uh, certainly, we haven't seen the instructions yet, so the nature of which or nature of circumstances in which that code could be used could, could vary, but I think it's a wait and see in that circumstance. All right, so going into 2017, I mean, uh, a couple key takeaways here, thoughts I want to reiterate with you. First, you certainly want to be... Uh, 100% confident that uh, the you're, you're hitting that 95% threshold. Uh, there is no margin for error at this point, uh, or a slim. It's a slim margin for error, I guess I should say. And so, while if you hit you know 94, 80% or 83% or whatever last year, that was probably good enough to mitigate that big risk. Uh, this year, there is no margin for error. Uh, one of the things that always we always get asked is, um, is the IRS actually going to impose penalties in this circumstance? Um, and we actually hired uh, the guy who wrote these regulations. He now works in our D.C. office. Um, we got a Secret Service protection uh, because he's otherwise known as the most uh, disliked man in America. Um, but I was talking to him about this, and, you know, is the IRS going to impose these penalties? And he said... Uh, uh, a couple things. Number one, he said, look, they have a branch that is devoted to this, and they're responsible for assessing and collecting penalties. Number two, they're not really going out and looking for uh, nitpicky type items because they've got too much on their plate otherwise to do that. But number three, what you have to realize is that there are triggers that, you know, come, come up and smack the IRS in the face and say, hey, uh, this company didn't do what it was supposed to do. And those triggers include, number one, you're submitting forms saying whether you hit that threshold. So hopefully you didn't lie. I uh, don't want to encourage that. But if you, you know, check, don't, if you check no on the form saying, did you offer coverage to 95% of your employees, his response was, you, you absolutely are going to receive a letter from the IRS saying, here's your tax bill for, you know, a million dollars. Um, number two, the other trigger is that you have to recall that there are federal tax dollars in play here, and those federal tax dollars are flowing to uh, – individuals who were not offered coverage by you who received a tax credit on the exchange. And the whole, you know, premise of this law or the way that it's I, it is never going to be budget neutral, but the way that it is more budget neutral than it already is, otherwise is, is, is premised on the fact that if you don't offer coverage, that employee gets a tax credit, and you're assessed a penalty to help offset that tax credit. So, you know, in the face of the IRS receiving a notice from the exchange that this person worked for you and didn't get offered coverage, you know, uh, generally you can assume that there's going to be a penalty assessed in that circumstance. So, again, uh, I don't want to suggest that, you know, if you had a, you know, you know, 10,000 employees and you missed one person, you need to be sitting around biting your fingernails. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I also don't want to suggest that you can do nothing or, uh, pardon my French, half-ass it, and you'll, you'll still be fine um, because that could be a problem. Um, a couple questions that came through here. I'll keep plowing ahead. Can an employer make individuals independent contractors instead of employees? Uh, generally, no. You don't get to pick whether somebody's labeled an independent contractor or an employee. I mean, I know in reality you do that, but um, the circumstances dictate whether someone is an employee or an independent contractor, not your label. Um, so uh, at the end of the day, uh, if you uh, – if you just take somebody who's an employee and relabel them an independent contractor, uh, that's not going to work. It has the circumstances have to align. They have to have control over their own operations, have the ability to work for other organizations, control their own start and stop times. They're high, more highly skilled, have their own materials, uh, can work from wherever. I mean, I'm just listing some of the factors um, uh, at the end of the day. Another question that came through here was, why wouldn't we just offer an ACA-compliant plan to everyone at the time of application? Uh, you can absolutely do that. Um, I think the reason that people don't do that is because offering health insurance, especially if people enroll in it, uh, can be expensive. Um, but if you have the financial means to cover everybody in your organization, uh, you are 
the IRS and the Obama administration's best friend. They're never going to penalize you in that circumstance, and the offer alone is all that it, uh, apply, uh, applies. Uh, the next one that came through is those employers who offer a MEC, which is indemnity plan. Um, I think that's getting at something else. Uh, there were new regulations that came out that addressed fixed indemnity plans and, and how the DOL views those. Let me table that one because it's a bit on the periphery, and if we have time at the end, I'll come back around to that one, but I can certainly talk about indemnity plans. Uh, other things you need to consider here. Number one, uh, if your plan's eligibility rules are conditioned on um, uh, are conditioned on, you know, uh, the ACA measurement and stability periods, then ERISA requires, again, if you're subject to ERISA, that you have those rules written down somewhere. So, again, if you're identifying people who are eligible for coverage based on these ACA rules, you need to have that documented somewhere through plan document, summary plan description, written eligibility policy. We've seen it done many ways, but you need to keep that in mind. Uh, reporting can be complicated. Many people have determined that, and it can be even more complicated if your only option is electronic filing. So you want to think early and often about whether you should hire a vendor uh, to help you handle that um, and, uh, and uh, proceed accordingly. Uh, I already mentioned you want to make sure your control group uh, is correct. Um, start as early as possible. I know a lot of people got on board in you know December and they were fortunate in that there was an extension this year. But uh, absent IRS extension, which we can't guarantee will happen this year, the deadline in 2016 uh, will be January of 2017. So you've got a lot less time and you don't want to ruin your holidays working through them. Uh, I already mentioned the good faith reporting standard. Let me take a couple things here that came through. Um, Oh, all right. Uh, if we offered coverage in 2015 and the employee waived, do we have to offer again for 2016? The answer is yes. Uh, you have to uh, make an offer of coverage at least once per year. Um, the next question that came through, what is the best way to document established measurement periods in the plan document or a separate written policy? We always kind of like doing a separate policy. The reason why is your plan document might apply more broadly. Your eligibility rules in that policy might apply more broadly to things like dental and vision and life insurance that don't run on the ACA rules. Certainly you can, but most of the organizations are not. So we've generally been splitting that out into a separate written policy, uh, which is a little easier for, for a number of reasons. But certainly it's a matter of preference. What documentation is needed to refute a claim that coverage was not offered? Uh, the IRS is not. Uh, given a clear gold standard, um, although that being said, uh, it's going to be very difficult from an employee for an employee to refute uh, paper that they signed declining coverage. That's the gold standard, obviously. Um, or you know, a default enrollment where you only get out if you uh, effectively opt out. Uh, that's certainly a gold standard as well. That said, uh, it's not legally required. So uh, there are a number of lesser standards that theoretically should work, and we'll know a lot more this year about what the IRS is willing to accept and not accept. But if you find yourself in a circumstance where it's a he said, he said she said type circumstance, we think we offered it, they said they never got it, uh, you want to have pretty good evidence that you've got good systems in place to send out to the correct address and all those types of things. Um, so uh, be careful there. Uh, you mentioned affordability is 9.5%. I thought that increased to 9.66%. That is correct. Uh, in December, the IRS announced that affordability threshold will be inflation adjusted. Uh, and for 2016, that adjusted level is 9.66% of household income. Uh, so you've got a little bit more flexibility there. All right. Um, you know, for the sake of time, uh, well, let me hit on a couple of these. We saw a lot of mistakes in the first year. Um, a lot of people made the assumption they didn't have to do any reporting for employees who were covered by a multi-employer union plan. That is incorrect. Uh, if you have a multi-employer union plan, um, you uh, are still subject to um, reporting for that individual if he was a full-time employee. So you, there are some special rules that apply in that context. Um, employees working for any employer within a control group, all the hours roll up towards full-time status. So if you have time split between two related employers, uh, you're still going to be a full-time employee in that context. Uh, you know, a number of other things here that I don't want to linger on because I do want to talk about the appeals. Um, oh, this one's important, though. A lot of people seem to report on Line 14 the offer of coverage based on what the employee enrolled in rather than what they were offered. 
Line 14 is, uh, is supposed to be a representation of what the employee was offered, regardless of what they enrolled in. So if they were offered family coverage and they enrolled in self-only coverage, you should still be reporting that they were offered family coverage. Uh, failure to do so um, uh, is problematic for a number of reasons. First, you could potentially be penalized um, uh, for misreporting because the IRS needs to know whether their dependents were offered coverage. Uh, for the individual mandate purposes, um, and there's some other risks there as well. That was a pretty common mistake we saw, an unfortunately very common mistake given how clear the rules are on this point. Um, COBRA coding, I think stay tuned on COBRA. A lot of people did it wrong in the first year, but it was confusing, so, you know, you get hopefully get a pass on that one. Um, but. I think the IRS is going to have to clarify the COBRA reporting for next year because it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense where they ended up on that. All right. So uh, I gave a presentation very similar to this on June 30th at about 10 a.m. And at that time, there was a room full of 100 people, and I asked the room, uh, has anybody um, received notices from the health insurance marketplace that their employees have received a tax credit? Nobody had. Go back and sit down at my desk at noon, and suddenly I've got a flood of emails saying, I'm getting these notices, what do I do? Uh, the key there being, uh, I think they sent them all out probably, uh, you know, the day before, and so they started hitting all employer inboxes shortly thereafter. Um, taking a step back, let me talk a little bit about how the process works uh, and to, so that you have an understanding of what you're receiving and what your obligations are. I'm going to talk about this in the context of 2016, the calendar year 2016, all right? So um, uh, to do so, we need to take a step back to open enrollment 2015, and assuming you as an employer have a calendar year plan, going into 2016, employees under the individual mandate need to obtain coverage, and they have a couple different avenues they can go. Clearly, the best avenue is through an employer-sponsored plan if it's available, uh, because if it's available and they decline, they cannot get a tax credit on the exchanges. So uh, employees going into 2016 um, had to make a decision to get coverage through you, the employer, or through the exchange. If you did not offer them coverage, um, uh, then uh, you know the next best avenue is the marketplace because they can get a tax credit for that. So going into 2016, they apply to the marketplace. They make a representation whether the employer offered them coverage, and they enroll. Then, in the spring of 2016, uh, was when it was supposed to happen, but what turned out to be June 30th of 2016, the marketplaces are supposed to send out to employers notices saying these employees came and said you didn't offer them health insurance coverage and they got a tax credit as a result. Uh, do you have any reason to believe that they didn't qualify for this tax credit? At that, op at that point, from uh, the date of the notice, you have 90 days to appeal and say, well, they actually shouldn't be receiving a tax credit for X, Y, and Z reason. Um, that is an optional appeal. Uh, there, I'll talk in a minute about why you may or may not appeal that determination, but there are no consequences that directly flow to you as an employer for failure to appeal that marketplace notice. Uh, that said, there are a number of reasons why you might want to, which I'll talk about in a minute. Based on the outcome of that appeal, the exchange is now going to send a letter to the IRS saying this employee says they worked for this employer. They say the employer didn't offer them coverage. The employer did not contest that. The employee received a tax credit. Uh, that's all going to happen in 2017, so January 2017 this year uh, is when it goes to the employees, and then again March of 2017, February or March 2017 is when the IRS gets that no those notices. So late 2017, the IRS is going to notify you with a penalty note. It's going to say, uh, this person said they didn't get offered coverage, um, and you did not tell us you offered them coverage. Let's play that circumstance out first. And as a result, here is your penalty notice. Um, you can appeal it. Uh, the other circumstance might be, well, look, this employee said they didn't get coverage. We've got a report from you, the employer, which you sent in March of 2017, saying you did offer them coverage. Let's talk about it and figure out what happened here. Um, in either circumstance, you now have an opportunity to appeal that IRS penalty notice, and that is the stage where you must appeal or accept the penalty, uh, you know, if you don't want to appeal or you don't have any basis for appealing. Um, so that's, again, late 2017 when that all goes down relating to 2016 coverage. Uh, so you have to be a little cautious because your liability for 2016 or for 2015 for that matter hasn't even arisen yet. 
Um, uh, well, I mean, it has arisen. It's all all the events have played out to trigger that penalty for you. The only step left is the back end uh, reporting function. Um, so. Uh, and that's the timeline right here. Uh, you know, 2016 they enroll, spring, uh, 90 days. Uh, so we talked about all that, and then it's all going to come to a head in late 2017. Now, uh, the notice that you're receiving from the appeals uh, from the marketplaces, which again is the only one we've received so far, is going to look uh, well. This is an excerpt from it or a snippet from it, but. Most marketplaces are going to have the same notices, and one, I think, key takeaway here is that there is this uh, big disclaimer at the bottom that it is a violation of the Fair Labor Standards Act to discriminate against an employee because they got a tax credit. Uh, what that means is if you get this notice, don't just fire that person and say problem solved. Uh, that is against the law, and we do not recommend that. Uh, but you can appeal that. To, you may appeal that determination. That is permitted, and we certainly encourage you to do so in certain circumstances. There is a standard form that the uh, marketplace has made available for appealing. Um, I've got an excerpt here from that form for you to, to, to peruse. Um, but uh, I think the key there is, um, you know, uh, in certain circumstances, uh, you are going to be provided with that opportunity. Uh, it's not very employer-friendly. Tell us why you're ruining this employee's life by appealing this determination. Uh, I'm exaggerating there somewhat, but uh, that's kind of what it's hinting at. Uh, I think the key takeaway, though, is that you're not doing the employee a disservice if you believe they're ineligible for tax credit um, and they've received one. Um, Again, the pros of appealing are, number one, you're still in the current year, and it's your opportunity to state your case. Uh, if you're wrong, um, you can still fix it for the second half of the year and cut your liability in half because the liability accrues on a month-by-month -month basis. If you wait for the IRS appeals process, the year is over and you're out of luck. Um, you could also save the employee money. Uh, employees who receive a tax credit in error because they failed to properly represent that they got coverage offer from their employer have to pay that money back eventually. Um, so, uh, you know, to, at the end of the day, um, if you uh, uh, don't do anything, the employee is going to continue receiving that tax credit, um, and, you know, they may uh, have a much bigger tax bill at the end of the year because you didn't do anything about it. So certainly worth uh, doing it there. The cons are the reason you might not appeal. Again, the uh, marketplace uh, appeal notice says, tell us why you don't think this person should get a tax credit. There are a number of reasons why you might appeal, but uh, or ways you might appeal that wouldn't impact that individual's tax credit eligibility, like, for instance, uh, saying, they're a part-time employee, so I shouldn't have been offering, I didn't have to offer them health insurance coverage. Well, if they're part-time and you didn't have to offer them health insurance and you didn't, then they're still eligible for a tax credit on the exchange, so there's no benefit to the exchange of being told we didn't have to do anything because that's not going to take away the employee's tax credit. Uh, similarly, if you say it's, uh, uh, you know, not my employee, so I didn't have to offer them health insurance coverage. That one's a more, bit more of a gray area. I'm always a fan of going on record whenever possible if an employee is saying that they're your, or an individual is saying that they're your, they're your employee and they're not. Um, uh, you know, making sure that there's nothing on record of you letting that statement stand. So I'm a bit more of a fan of appealing in that circumstance. Another circumstance that comes up is what about uh, individuals or employers that aren't even applicable large employers and they get this? Do they have to appeal? Uh, again, the answer is no from an employer mandate standpoint, but, you, you know, if you offer that individual coverage, again, there might still be a benefit of doing so because an offer of health insurance coverage or enrollment in health insurance coverage can disqualify that employee from a tax credit. Uh, so, uh, you know, at the end of the day, you're helping the employee in that circumstance. But, again, none of this is legally required. Uh, should brokers, advisors assist employers in appealing to HHS if they do? Is there any liability for the broker facilitating the appeal? Uh, you know, a couple standards there. Broker, broker, you know, liability can be on a, be state specific and contractual specific. So generally, uh, I know people are looking to the brokers a lot to help them with this stuff. I'm not going to say don't do it. Uh, what I would say, uh, unless you want to take on the liability, is to make sure when you're doing it you have all necessary and appropriate disclaimers about consulting with legal counsel and you're, that you're not providing tax advice because otherwise uh, you might be creating the impression that that is what you are uh, doing. Um, Again, I talked about this, uh, contingent workers, part-time variable hour employees, maybe you don't appeal because you can't at this stage impact 
uh, their tax credit eligibility. Certainly, by the way, with either group, if the IRS attempts to assess a penalty based on these populations, you absolutely should appeal because you shouldn't be penalized in that circumstance. But at the marketplace level, again, that's not your uh, that's not your last opportunity to appeal. You're still going to have the opportunity to go to the IRS in that circumstance. So, uh, you know, <clears throat> uh, it's it's sort of a judgment call as to whether you want to do it at that point. All right. Uh, so with that, I think I hopefully hit on everything. Let me see if I can pick up a few of the questions that may have come in uh, in the interim that we didn't pick up on. Uh, Part-timer offer coverage and declined coverage then went to the marketplace and you receive a notice, do you need to appeal? I mean, if that part-timer was offered affordable minimum value coverage, theoretically that can impact their tax credit eligibility. So, you know, whether you appeal it's a question of sort of an employee relations type thing. Um, if it's going to come out to the IRS sooner or later, uh, but it may not, right? I mean, you don't, you're not required to report on part-timers, even those whom you've offered coverage. Uh, so, you know, that's a judgment call. Um, it's really hard to say in that context. I mean, uh, the IRS probably wants to know, but they probably won't find out if you don't tell them. Um, and you could just be harming your employee. So. Uh, it still might come out, but uh, it's, it's a bit more of a, a nuanced sort of judgment call type situation. All right. Uh, I think I hit on most of the things that came in as we went. Um, let me just talk briefly about the fixed indemnity piece. <clears throat> um, for for uh, So a lot of people have seen these types of AFLAC, Transamerica, various other types of policies that are called fixed indemnity policies, and what they are are policies that um, uh, that, uh, generally speaking, uh, reimburse people based on days in the hospital or based on days in a doctor's office or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, at the end of the day, uh, those are have a very valuable exemption from ACA standards and specifically the prohibition on annual dollar limits. Uh, but it is premised on the fact that that's not supposed to be a health insurance policy. It's supposed to be an income replacement policy, uh, meaning uh, that uh, meaning that you're replacing their income because they're missing work to go to the hospital rather than that you're reimbursing them for the medical expenses in the hospital. But, you know, the whole premise of that exemption from the annual dollar limit is, is contingent on that not being a medical reimbursement policy. So, uh, if, for instance, you um, uh, have a policy like that and it starts looking more like health insurance, which many of them have, that's going to become problematic and the, I, and the IRS and DOL have the right to say, we think this is health insurance and as a result, it's pro you can't have an annual dollar limit, which is usually problematic under these policies because they almost all have annual dollar limits. The most recent guidance, which was a reiteration of various other forms of guidance, was the IRS saying, look, if you want to qualify for that fixed indemnity exemption, uh, you must make sure that that policy only reimburses on a per diem basis as opposed to on a, you know, percent of expenses basis or whatever the case might be. Uh, and number two, the amount of reimbursement shouldn't vary based on the type of service you receive in a particular facility. So you shouldn't have one reimbursement rate for a surgery in a hospital and another for an x-ray in a hospital. I mean, again, the key is you're in the hospital and you're missing work, but the nature of your procedure shouldn't influence the amount of the reimbursement in that respect. So if you have policies that uh, do any of those types of things, uh, you potentially have uh, problems in that circumstance uh, uh, at the end of the day. And let me just make sure, because I got another question that came in. Um, these are, the point here is that these are valuable policies. Um, uh, it's, this is not confusing. I'm not sure what that what that comment is, but uh, I guess my takeaway here is not that you can't offer fixed indemnity policies because you clearly can. Uh, there's nothing illegal about a fixed indemnity policy. The key is that the IRS prohibits and the DOL prohibit you from structuring a fixed indemnity policy to be reimbursement for health insurance, and they've laid out very clear standards for what you must do. Uh, to satisfy that threshold. The final standard that they have required uh, is that in the enrollment materials for these benefits, you must make clear that these are not health insurance. Um, and at the end of the day, uh, uh, you could be, you know, penalized, not just under the employer mandate, this is not an employer mandate thing, but that you could face liability um, uh, for 
you know, structuring that the wrong way. Okay. Uh, other one that came in, what are the rules on offering employees incentives to enroll elsewhere? I'm going to do the best I can in the next minute. Um, generally speaking, uh, an unconditional opt-out uh, must be factored into the affordability of coverage. So that's an opt-out that's available regardless of whether you enroll in other coverage. If it's an eligible conditional opt-out, though, it doesn't impact affordability. In other words, uh, if you verify at the time of opt-out that they are enrolling in other qualifying coverage that's not an individual insurance policy, and that not just the employee is enrolling, but also that their tax dependents are enrolling, then you can provide them with that opt-out payment and you wouldn't have to adjust the affordability of their coverage. Um, so a lot of good stuff there, and I know a lot remaining. Try to get to everything we could, but I'm going to flip it back to Jenny now. Thank you so much, Ben. And to all of you that have asked questions, for those of you that are um, Chris participants, I'll be delighted to forward those over to the faculty and see um, which of the faculty will have time. And um, I'd like to thank Ben, as usual, for his excellent presentation and just kind of the clarity that you bring, Ben, with Safe Arts and with your expertise. It's just always nice to work with somebody who really gets it, and we do appreciate you um, so much. So thank you. Um, for those of you that have not taken the CRIS program, we are um, offering a discount for you. Um, it's uh, code ACA now. Um, if you need to know how to use that code during the registration process, don't hesitate to call me, 561-790-1176. You can dial 802 or 837, um, and those folks will be happy to help you get registered. And again, Ben, we'll see you in uh, September for the annual conference. And uh, thanks, everyone, for attending. And for those of you that uh, were looking for a replay, um, we'll be sending that out, of course, to the Chris participants as well. Ben, thanks so much, and have a great day, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.